Hi everyone, welcome again to AlumCon Thursday Night Science Talks. We're so proud that you could join us after a very interesting week. I do want to start this Thursday evening with um, once again letting folks know who have seen impacts from Hurricane Sally that our thoughts are with them, especially our our uh, fellow Marine Lab, Dolphin Island Sea Lab, who were impacted greatly by this storm. So wishing all those folks in, in the Sea Lab a speedy recovery from Sally. Uh, all right, for those of you who are new to Lumpcon Science Talks, um, you're probably wondering where Craig is. Craig cannot be with us tonight. He is actually taking some much needed time off this week. So yay, Craig, um, which leaves me alone to do. <laughs> you don't get Craig talks uh, tonight, but you do get uh, Mert jokes tonight. And then I will be, <laughs> we'll be introducing Emily. And we do apologize, Emily's camera is not working. Um, so she is this hidden voice behind the curtain, so to speak. So, uh, <laughs> hi, Emily. <laughs> Glad and you could no be with us tonight. To the woman <laughs> behind the curtain. <laughs> <laughs> yep, the science is behind the curtain. All right, you guys. So, um, Emily, we're going to start with a couple of jokes. And because I couldn't find uh, great jokes that were directly related to the topic that we're going to talk to. I just picked the ocean. So our jokes this evening are ocean theme. So right. Emily and the audience, um, are you ready? So ready. So ready. All right. So <laughs> sorry. I'm getting a few comments. All right. <laughs> so here we go. Um, joke number one. All right. Where can where can you find an ocean with no water? Oh. Audience, do I, you have any guesses? You can use the question box to send in responses. I have such a strong urge to Google this, but I will not. <laughs> no, uh, no one can see you. <laughs> that's true. I could come across looking really great here. Um, but no, I, I will be an honest Abe about it. I, I don't know. On a map. <laughs> I don't know why that's funny to me, but that's really funny to me. <laughs> All right. Here's one that's kind of uh, nerdy and about the ocean. Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, what do you get? if you throw a million books into the sea? Um, oh. Oh. The Red, the red Sea. No, but that's really? a great guess. <laughs> that's not the answer Google gave me. The answer Google gave me was a tidal wave. Ah. <laughs> uh, uh. Yeah, your, yours was better. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I love a good pun either way. Chandler, that's funny. <laughs> All right. Chandler is on a great joke um, answering session. So <laughs> thanks, Chandler, for that. But anyway, I will get to business. Um, so you're all here to listen to a science talk by Dr. Emily Mung Douglas. Welcome, Emily, again. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me introduce Emily to those of you who do not know Emily. I love Emily, by the way. Um, so <laughs> if I beam, it's just because, you know, I love Emily. So uh, Emily is an oil spill science outreach specialist for Louisiana Sea Grant at LSU. Emily received a doctorate in marine biosciences from the University of Delaware and also holds degrees from Old Dominion University and the University of Connecticut. Go Huskies! 
<laughs> trained as a marine ecologist. She studied big picture questions using techniques from chemistry and ecotoxicology. During her schooling, she volunteered doing science outreach when possible, and then partnered with the Delaware Center for Inland Bays on the Citizen Science Project to better understand the spawning ecology and populations of horseshoe crabs in that particular estuary. Good for you, Ems. <laughs> her postdoc work in molecular toxicology as a visiting science fellow at Chi Min. Did I get it right? Shaman. Chaman <laughs> in China. See, I told you I would slaughter it. Um, she put her combined science and outreach experience to use for Louisiana Sea Grant L L at LSU, where she is the oil spill extension and outreach specialist. Originally from Cleveland, Ohio, Emily grew up in coastal Virginia, where her fascination for the ocean and the environment blossomed. She and her husband, Keith, now enjoy experiencing Louisiana with their two dogs, a cat, and their three-year-old son, Luca. And aren't we lucky for that? Thank you, Emily, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Mert, and thanks for that, that awesome introduction. And just so everyone knows, the feeling is mutual for Mert as well. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, lots of love here tonight. <laughs> Well, I will I will uh, leave the audience an intrigue as to how we, we know each other and work together until a little bit later in my talk, but um, the mystery will be solved. <laughs> in the meanwhile, uh, I'm going to talk with you all a little bit about oil spills, as you could probably guess. Um, as Mert mentioned, I'm Emily Mon Douglas, and uh, I'm with Louisiana Sea Grant uh, and also the Gulf of Mexico Sea Grant Oil Spill Science Outreach Team which is like the super long-winded way of telling you all that I spend a lot of time talking with folks about oil spills and trying to make sure that they get the information that they need to, to do their jobs and, uh, and just to be better uh, part of that flow of information. So uh, I'm going to share a little bit with you all about how uh, the science of oil spill cleanup, just touch on that a little bit, and also share a bit about uh, how animals cope with exposure to oil. But before I can really get into that, uh, to talk about oil spills, we really have to talk about oil first. So uh, let's get into that. And huh, I'm gonna figure out how to work my computer now, apparently. Let's see if I can advance the slides. There we go, all right. Uh, so some facts about oil. Uh, we all know oil, is often referred to as a fossil fuel. It uh, powers our homes. It's used to make asphalt for our roads, uh, powers our transportation vehicles. It's used in plastics production and, and the production of other types of cosmetic compounds like, uh, like Vaseline, for example, petroleum jelly, um, other types of, of items as well. Um, and actually, what is oil at its core? It's, it's actually marine life. Uh, plant and animal that um, fell to the seafloor, you know, died and fell to the seafloor hundreds of millions of years ago, and then actually got buried over time with um, bits of sediment. And uh, through different geologic processes, uh, heat working on it, that uh, those decaying bits of matter actually transformed over hundreds of millions of years into what we know as oil. And oil, even though we use this, this singular noun to describe it, it's actually not just a single compound. It's actually made up of lots and lots of different chemicals. Um, a lot of it is hydrogen and carbon. And uh, those are often referred to as hydrocarbons. But for the purposes of this talk, uh, I'll just be calling them oil-based compounds. Um, so there are different types of oil. Uh, some of them are uh, based on the chemistry. It creates different properties within oil. So some oils have a chemistry that makes them um, thick and gooey, kind of like with a consistency of honey or molasses. Other oils have a different sort of chemical makeup and that allows them to be more fluid. Um, so 
maybe a little bit more like the consistency of water. They can flow a little bit better. Uh, and all different oil is unique to the place that it originates from. So for example, oil that's from um, the coast of Louisiana is gonna be very different chemically than the oil that's from say like Venezuela. And the, those unique chemical signatures are because of that, uh, again, that, that makeup of uh, the oil. And you can kind of think of it sort of like a fingerprint, like a person's fingerprint, just like everyone has a fingerprint that is unique to them and, and can identify them. The same thing is true for oil. And scientists can actually take oil samples and identify it back to the source, which is really useful when there's an oil spill because um, uh, scientists can go out into the field, sample the oil or the water near where the oil was spilled and take that back to the lab and try to identify it back to the source. The, uh, the tricky caveat to that is that oil is not a stable uh, is not a stable compound. And so there's something called weathering that can happen. And weathering is essentially an aging process. So as soon as oil enters the marine environment, um, it begins to break down or, or degrade, we say. And so things like microbes, like, like bacteria, sunlight, oxygen, all of those things are gonna change the, the chemistry of the oil and degrade that, that chemical fingerprint of the oil. So it makes it kind of like what you're seeing on the screen here, that fingerprint going from left to right. Um, it gets kind of really smudgy, right? So that's kind of my, <laughs> my artistic impression of how a, a oil fingerprint chemically changes with weathering. But you get the idea that it, it could be significantly more difficult for a scientist to identify the source of, of oil the longer it's been in the environment. However, um, chemical techniques and instruments have gotten so much more sophisticated, even just in the last 10 years. So scientists are, are coming up with better and better ways to, uh, to chemically analyze oil and to, to ID it. Uh, so you might have noticed that I said when oil enters the marine environment. So what does that mean? Well, there are two ways that oil can get into the marine environment. Um, the first way that I think probably most of us might be thinking of are, are you know, oil spills, right? Unintentional uh, releases of oil, maybe from a, a vessel, you know, sinking, uh, something like that. Or also another way are natural oil seeps. And actually there's over 900 natural oil seeps in the Gulf of Mexico uh, that have been discovered. You can see them in this map that's shown all those dots are, are natural oil seeps. And in the Gulf of Mexico alone, they're responsible for over, over 42 million gallons of oil entering uh, the Gulf of Mexico every single year. And in North America overall, there's about 48 million gallons of oil that are entering uh, the marine waters from, from offshore seeps. Uh, 26 million gallons of oil annually enters from other ways. So that's those oil spills that I was talking about. So that's from things like oil production, uh, the transport of oil. So, um, you know, from with a cargo ship going from place to place or also just um, something like a boating accident. So those are different ways that oil can enter the environment. Um, for the purposes of this talk, I'll be talking about um, accidental oil spills. And probably the most famous or, or infamous of them is the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, which I think this audience is probably really familiar with. Um, it happened in 2010, about 50 miles off of the coast of Louisiana. Uh, approximately 172 million gallons of oil were released into the Gulf of Mexico uh, from a wellhead about a mile beneath the water surface. Uh, 11 lives were lost and uh, roughly 1.8 million gallons of chemical dispersants were used uh, to help break up the oil into tiny droplets. And remember those uh, dispersants were used in an effort to try to um, expedite the natural breakdown process of oil. So with not just Deepwater Horizon, but really 
any oil spill, there are a lot of challenges that come up, uh, not just impacts to the environment and animals, but lots of other really complex challenges that come into play. Like uh, there are concerns over, uh, depending on the, the nature of a spill, obviously, you might have a, a, all of these challenges might arise or maybe some uh, combination of them. But uh, something that came up with Deepwater Horizon, obviously, are, are impacts to wildlife and the environment, also concerns over things like seafood safety and um, fishery closures occurred and um, there were uh, closures of beaches, so there are declines in tourism and a lot of our uh, you know, our coastal economies in the Gulf of Mexico are really dependent on both fisheries and tourism. So then this causes uh, a lot of, you know, economic impacts and stress to coastal residents. And uh, because of this, the nature of this event, um, just the sheer volume of oil and dispersant involved. And also, um, this was the first time that dispersant was used at depth. It was not uh, just applied on the surface of the water, but also at the site of the, the spill at the wellhead, one mile down. That's the first time in history that had been done. And so with all those different uh, unknowns, there are a lot of, uh, I think there, are, there was a lot of added stress to the situation just from those, those gaps in the knowledge. Uh, so different funding agencies tried to step in and help fill in some of those gaps in knowledge uh, by funding research. And one of those is the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative, or GOMERI. Uh, GOMERI, if you're not already familiar with it, is a $500 million investment by BP from non-penalty funds. So it's completely separate from the Restore Act. It's managed by the Gulf of Mexico Alliance, or GOMA, and also a 20-member independent research board. Uh, so it's actually modeled after the National Science Foundation. Uh, GOMERI's, uh, I guess GOMERI's aim is to, to help society better deal with oil spills, and so um, from multiple angles. So they funded uh, over the past 10 years, as I mentioned, $500 million trying to understand uh, where oil and dispersants end up in the environment after a spill, um, how they, they break down chemically over time and what their, their impacts are to animals and habitats and people, and also what kinds of technologies can, can study those uh, oil spill impacts best. Uh, so Gomery has funded a lot of research efforts, including one which is now the mystery is solved, Mert. <laughs> How Mert and I know each other. Uh, Mert's actually uh, the education lead for one of the, the research consortia that was funded by Gomery. So um, that's the Coastal Waters Consortium. And if you're not familiar with their work, they've done a lot of really cool stuff uh, looking at oil spill impacts to wetlands. And, uh, and Mert has done so much cool um, place-based education for that effort as well. And that's how we've gotten to know each other. Um, one of those other outreach efforts that, that Gomery has invested in to try to help share oil spill science is uh, with Sea Grant. So Sea Grant, if you're not already familiar with us, um, as I mentioned before, I'm with Louisiana Sea Grant, but there's actually uh, not just Sea Grant in Louisiana, but one in every coastal state in the United States, including the Great Lakes and uh, also Puerto Rico and Hawaii and Guam. There's 34 uh, Sea Grant programs nationwide. And our mission is to promote and enhance the practical and responsible use of our coastal and marine resources. We're non-advocacy. So that means that while we can't push specific viewpoints, we do try to provide the best available science on any given topic. Uh, we receive both federal and state funding, and we have four programs here in the Gulf of Mexico alone. And uh, so as part of Sea Grant's partnership with Gomery to try to help share oil spill science, uh, I work in partnership with the other Sea Grant programs across the Gulf of Mexico. We have a six-member team, and we all have different areas of expertise. So 
Uh, as Mert mentioned, I have a, a broad background in ecology and I subspecialized in, in understanding the impacts of pollution on animals, so ecotoxicology. We also have uh, other folks on the team that have fishery science backgrounds, uh, backgrounds in, in human dimensions and also um, physical oceanography, so understanding the transport of oil and dispersants in the environment. We also have a program manager and a communications specialist. So we all work together to try to uh, cohesively take the science about deep water horizon oil spill and just oil spills in general and make it uh, accessible for other folks. And uh, we work really specifically with these target audiences listed here. Um, kind of a, a, a broad grouping you might notice, but really our target audiences fall into one of two categories. Um, people who could use uh, oil spill science information for on-the-job decision-making, so like emergency responders or uh, natural resource managers, or also folks who just depend on a clean and healthy Gulf of Mexico, but a lot of times are left out of that, that flow of information uh, that I was talking about before. So like our, our tourism professionals or our, um, our fishermen as well. So we try to, to make our, our science accessible for a wide variety of folks. And, um, but you don't wanna just be spouting out <laughs> information that may or may not be needed. So we've actually, over the course of the last six years that we've had our, our program, um, this partnership between Sea Grant and Gomery, um, we've talked with several thousand folks and tried to understand what types of oil spill science questions they still have. And, uh, what would help them do their jobs better, what would help them sleep better to, at night uh, if there had been an oil spill today. And we've taken those questions and uh, scoured the scientific literature. So we only, we only deal in peer-reviewed published uh, science or government white papers, so things that uh, are considered vetted science, and uh, take that information synthesize it so on any given topic just find out as much as we can about it uh, put together all the information from all the different angles and translate it into plain english out of scientific jargon into plain english so that it's accessible for for everyone and then we uh we share it on uh in a number of different ways which i'll talk about later but um, it's, it's really a pleasure to get to talk with you all tonight and uh, get to share some of the science. Uh, so let's see. One of the questions that we, we've gotten quite a bit over the years are, is that people want to know how are oil spills cleaned up and what's some of the science behind that. So I'm just going to touch a little bit on that because obviously that can get a little bit detailed, but um, Here's a little bit of information, but I would like to start out by saying that oil spill cleanup does not happen the day that an oil spill occurs, or it does happen, but it doesn't start there. Um, it actually, it happens all year long. That, that spill that you hear about on the news, the, the cleanup for that has actually been in preparation before that spill ever happened. Um, there's actually um, something called area committees and regional response teams. And those are groups of emergency response professionals that actually gather together at both the, the local and the regional levels um, multiple times per year. Um, and attendees at these, these meetings actually represent agencies from several sectors, including local, state, and federal, uh, federal agencies. Uh, industry, sometimes uh, NGOs, non-governmental organizations as well, um, and topics of discussion can include uh, or do include actually response techniques, lessons learned from previous spills, and planning for future spills. Uh, they also discuss uh, documents which are known as contingency plans, and uh, those are used for guidance on response options. And they also are um, they're also obliged to do something that are sometimes referred to as spill drills or spill preparedness exercises. And um, 
this this helps train all the responders on uh, the latest uh, response techniques and how to apply them and just prepares them for a multitude of, of oil spill scenarios and um, gets everybody coordinated and working together so that when an oil spill happens, uh, everyone's really comfortable with working with one another and, and knows their role in the situation. And there's uh, there are scientific support coordinators at the state and federal levels that, that work at these spills and make sure that, uh, that, that up to date, up to the minute science is incorporated into every response decision that's made. And the really cool thing is that area committees are open to anyone. You don't have to be an emergency responder to be part of them. That's actually me in that photograph um, down on the lower right. I'm the second from the right. Um, I got to participate in a spill drill. Um, I'm with Louisiana Sea Grant and I participate Kate in the area committees and the response, regional response teams. And I actually got to participate as part of that, that oil spill um, drill. And it was a really eye-opening experience getting to see everybody working so hard together to make sure that uh, everything is really well prepared for when a, an actual oil spill does occur. So in terms of the the actual techniques that are used the day of a spill. Um, a technique that I think a lot of us are probably familiar with from seeing it on the news are, are booms. And booms are the, this kind of, I don't know if you all can see my mouse. It's this kind of orange sausage link <laughs> looking thing that's kind of corralling around the oil. Um, so that's a boom and booms, uh, as I just mentioned, they corral the oil into a given location. They deflect it out of sensitive habitats. Um, they, there's many different types of booms. Some of them are made up of, of uh, plastic or metal, or they can contain sorbents, so they can actually soak up the oil. Uh, sorbents are, are natural or man-made fibers that that can be used kind of almost like a sponge to suck up the oil. So sometimes you have booms that are filled with these sorbents. Uh, and a lot of times uh, booms are used in combination with, with other techniques such as skimmers, which um, if you look at the lower right hand corner of the, uh, the image, you see three orange sort of pods with a, a circle in the middle, that's a skimmer. And so oil actually gets, um, can there's multiple different types of skimmers but the oil actually gets physically removed from the water using the skimmer um, and so there's minimal environmental impact so that's a, a nice feature of skimmers um, but both booms and skimmers like all oil spill response techniques they all have their um, their specific uses I guess would be a good way to say it um, so for example if you're in an area with um, heavy heavy winds and waves, uh, a boom or a skimmer might not necessarily be the, the best tool. Um, with the with a boom, the oil can easily go over or under the boom if there's a lot of uh, a lot of currents, or if there's a lot of oil, a lot of large volume of oil, or let's say that there's a lot of debris in the water or ice. A lot of skimmers might not be able to handle that. It can clog them up. So um, something that, a way that I choose to think about it is um, kind of like, like when you're cooking, you might have a lot of spices in your cabinet, um, but you're not necessarily gonna use every single spice for every single dish that you prepare in your kitchen. <laughs> so while you're, your garlic powder might be your go-to for creating a really good pasta sauce. It's probably not going to taste really great in your chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> so uh, it's sort of the same thing with with oil spills. You can't always use um, you can't use a boom with every response situation. You can't use a skimmer with every response situation either. But I will say before we we move on that there are constantly 
new developments that are being made to both of those uh, technologies to try to improve them. Um, so for example, there, there are different um, uh, materials that they're trying out for booms or different configurations of even using multiple booms together or with skimmers. Um, as I mentioned, there are different types of skimmers. And so um, engineers and scientists have experimented with different ways to try to improve the, uh, the efficiency of removing the oil from the water using um, different types of materials and the skimmers and so on. Uh, so another technique that's uh, sometimes used during oil spills is called in situ burning. And so that literally means burning in the water. Um, so you can see in this image that there's actually these two vessels are are pulling a boom or they're they're holding a boom in place really and you can see that the oil is kind of kept in place by that boom and the the oil is being burned off the water in situ burning um depending on the situation can actually remove up to 95 percent of the oil in the water and it does this by uh, when you when the oil is burned, it converts it from uh, from that oil slick into carbon dioxide and water. Uh, but of course, other types of compounds are also created in the process. Um, so air quality and water quality have to be really closely monitored. Um, also, residues and particulates can sink to the seafloor, so that's that's another consideration. Uh, for obvious reasons, you can't do this this kind of technique when there's uh, you know heavy seas or 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 uh, winds. And also, something else to keep in mind is that the this is a technique that can only be done when the oil is very very fresh, because once oil has been uh, I guess you could say sitting out <laughs> sitting out in the water for uh, a while, then it's water starts to mix in with the oil and it creates something called an emulsion. So you can kind of think of um, like your mayonnaise in your refrigerator is an example of an emulsion. And um, emulsions of oil and water are not something that, that will catch on fire very easily or stay on fire. So um, you really need that fresh oil to be able to burn it. And also you have to have an oil slick that's at least 0.04 uh, inches thick, which is about the thickness of a dime. So that doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're dealing with an oil spill that's that's quickly spreading out on the water, that's actually a little bit thick. So in order to maintain that thickness, to maintain the burn, um, then the emergency responders use that that boom that you see there and the the image to to kind of corral the oil a little bit so they can create a thicker pool of oil uh, to burn off. So that's something uh, to keep in mind with that response technique. So dispersants, we get a lot of questions within our program about dispersants. Uh, so as I mentioned previously, uh, dispersants, dispersants are those compounds that emergency responders use to break up uh, oil during deep water horizon into smaller droplets. And by doing that, then that actually, uh, the idea behind that is to help break up the oil into tiny droplets that are then more, um, more easily broken down by, by things like microbes and other, other natural processes like sunlight and wind and waves. Um, so expediting natural processes. Uh, there's been some, some research studies in recent years that uh, suggest that dispersants may have protected air quality during the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And that's because oil evaporates. Like the first, I believe it's the first 72 hours, a lot of those compounds in oil are, are what scientists call volatile. They're really, really volatile. So they're, they create a lot of vapors in the atmosphere. Um, as that oil evaporates. However, those vapors are, are toxic, so they're harmful to, uh, to air-breathing animals. So for example, dolphins would be an example. Um, however, with dispersants, 
And with all of these emergency response techniques, there are trade-offs. So uh, while you're reducing the amount of, of oil vapors that are in the air, um, then the oil is instead broken up into those small droplets, as I mentioned, and actually gets mixed into the water more. And um, that makes the oil-based compounds more available to, to sea life that lives in the water. So that's, uh, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, also, dispersants are best used on fresh oil. They're not going to be something that can be used after the oil has been uh, out in the marine environment for several days. So it's, it's with a lot of these techniques, it's something where a decision has to be made relatively quickly about whether or not you're going to, to use it or not. And there are uh, actually a lot of regulations in place for the use of, of these techniques. Um, the in-situ burning, as I mentioned, there's a lot of um, monitoring that goes on for both air and water quality, and the same is true for dispersants as well. So just to give you all just a little bit more insight into how dispersants work, um, so this in this this image, the orange uh, the orange stuff is dispersant, <laughs> and the black is the uh, the oil slick itself. So if you look on that zoomed in image, so I I don't believe you often see my mouse. Um, if we think about the the portion of the dispersant called the surfactant, that's kind of I guess you could sort of think of it kind of like soap. Um, it's not soap, but it's sort of a similar function to soap. Uh, there's a portion of it that is attracted to water and that's kind of like, it sort of looks like a lollipop, right? So the candy of the lollipop is attracted to the water and the stick is attracted to oil. So when oil droplets are formed, each of these little lollipops get stuck into that droplet of oil a little bit like a pin in a pin cushion and once you have enough of those pins sort of enveloping that droplet of oil it's very difficult for that droplet to get back together with the other droplets to reform an oil slick um, dispersants dispersants are used when there's just enough just enough waves happening that the oil is going to be mixing in the water anyways, and then it helps um, just further create those little tiny, tiny droplets and prevent them from getting back together to make that slick. If there were no dispersants in the water, then as I mentioned, they would just get back together to reform the slick. Um, so once you have those little tiny droplets forming, then bacteria and other microorganisms can actually colonize the oil droplet and break it down. So Another question that we get asked a lot by folks are, is how do animals cope with exposure to oil? So I'm just going to talk about two animals tonight and uh, fish and birds. <laughs> but um, actually there's, there are genes that are present in the human body, but also all higher order animals. So anything with a backbone, um, there are special genes in our bodies that code for um, dealing with foreign contaminants like oil. So um, the body can actually take those oil-based compounds, break them down, and eliminate them. However, that doesn't mean that it doesn't come at a cost to the animal, but the body is capable of eliminating those compounds. Um, they are also uh, present in some invertebrates also. So invertebrates are animals without backbones, but they're not as well, well studied and the role of those genes isn't as well understood. Uh, but scientists argue back and forth about the role of those in invertebrates. So I'm going to show a video that my program created that's actually looking at how fish cope with exposure to oil in the environment. Some animals, like fish, can break down and eliminate the compounds found in oil from their bodies. 
how does this happen? When a fish encounters oil, its body activates genes that help cope with the exposure. The activation of these genes triggers a chain reaction of processes in the liver and other organs, breaking down and removing oil-based compounds from the body. This ability is present not only in fish, but humans and other vertebrates as well. Every species has a unique set of behaviors that also come into play. For example, golden tiles naturally burrow into offshore sediments. If the sediments contain oil, it triggers the fish's oil breakdown mechanisms. Additionally, the burrowing behavior tends to expose golden tilefish to more oil than fish that do not burrow into sediments. Scientists find that even though a fish's body can break down oil, the chemicals the oil breaks down into can still have negative impacts on the fish. The level of oil exposure may also be so high that it overwhelms the fish's ability to cope. For example, Gulf killifish, raised in water containing sediments from heavily oiled marshes, have lower rates of survival and less success hatching than their unexposed counterparts. Oil-exposed fish also have lower heart rates and smaller body size. Similarly, exposure to small amounts of oil in the lab, even for brief periods, negatively impacts the swimming ability of young mahi-mahi as they age. Though a specific cause could not be pinpointed, scientists found that skin lesions in wild game fish, like red snapper, were correlated with oil exposure for a short time after the deep water horizon spill. There are many factors at play in the environment, making things less straightforward than in the lab. Because of this, scientists continue to use a combination of lab and field studies to understand how findings in individual fish translate to wild populations and communities of aquatic life. All right, now let's see if I can get back to my PowerPoint. <laughs> ah, okay. All right, so that's a little bit about fish and that gave me a nice little water break. Um, <laughs> so uh, another animal that we get asked about quite a bit, birds. Birds, as I mentioned, uh, you can probably guess that they also have those those genes that can help them cope with with oil exposure. But uh, similarly to what you just heard about with fish, um, it doesn't mean that it's it, that oil exposure is without consequence for them. So there can be multiple routes of exposure. Um, birds getting uh, oil on their feathers can be a pro can be problematic just because uh, if you think about the way that birds live they spend a lot of time preening and straightening their feathers and that's not just to look good that's actually a survival skill uh, to make sure that all of their feathers are, are very clean and very straight is going to help them fly but it's also going to help keep them insulated as well um, so that's a very important um, behavior that they have and they're they're uh, actually end up ingesting oil when they they use their beaks to straighten and preen their feathers. Um, also, some oil can get on their, their skin itself as well, and they can absorb oil and oil-based compounds in that way. Uh, also, you figure that there are a lot of lots of birds that are coming in contact with oil through sand and water and also eating oil that are eating ingesting oil through their prey as well, um, if that has any oil on it. Um, additionally, if we think about um, how, again, bird behavior and uh, flying and migration, uh, if they have matted feathers, then they're not going to be able to regulate their body temperatures as well, because again, remember that their, their feathers are helping um, are, are part of the insulation for their, their, their bodies. So it's going to help maintain their body temperature. So if they are having clumps, that's not going to be a good thing. Uh, also, scientists have found that uh, increased flight times is a problem with birds who have even 
I think it was as little as 10% oiling. Um, be they actually spent a lot more time um, having to stop and rest compared to their un un unoiled counterparts. And so that really um, increased the amount of time it took them to, to migrate from point A to point B. Um, as I mentioned, increased in exhaustion. So then you can imagine that they need more, more food resources <laughs> to help replenish them. And also more time that they're, they're spent um, resting could also open them up to predation to being food for someone else as well. Uh, why did that not? Hmm. Okay, one moment. Having issues with my slides again. Okay, there you go. Uh, something else. So if we think about internal damage, once oil is inside of their bodies, as I mentioned, um, internally in terms of their physiology, they are able to cope with oil to some degree. However, um, it can cause them to have a form of, of anemia. Um, to have damage to their to their red blood cells, so they actually end up uh, not being able to transport oxygen efficiently around their body. Because remember, red blood cells are responsible for oxygen transport, and um, they can also have damage to their liver, which the liver, uh, as I'm sure you all know, is a is a big detoxification uh, organ in bodies, and uh, also heart problems, which is a really obviously uh, uh, bad bad side effect of, of oil exposure in birds. So those are just a, a few things from, from those two different groupings of animals. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more. Um, we have bulletins available on our website, uh, golfdgrant.org slash oil spill science or slash oil spill outreach. Uh, covering things like sea turtles and um, and dolphins and birds and oysters. And uh, we also have recordings of our seminars and workshops um, as well. And we have the animated videos, like one the one that I showed you. We also have another one on um, how seafood was uh, in how the safety of seafood was ensured after Deepwater Horizon. Uh, as well as other resources as well. So these are just some of the, the bulletins that I was talking about. Uh, we have something like 30 something available as well as fact sheets if you're interested. Um, something that I would like to point out that's really handy is that voters guide uh, on the far right. And it actually has uh, numbers and information on there in case you do end up uh, having a spill when you're on your boat. Um, who to call and what to do. So that's something that's handy. And I will point out that it's on waterproof paper. And uh, as I mentioned, we, we do a lot of uh, science uh, workshops and now they've all become webinars because of COVID. <laughs> but those are all recordings of those are all available on our website. And I would like to point out that we actually have two events coming up. Um, in the next couple of weeks. Next week, we have a, an uh, oil spill science webinar um, focused on Louisiana and the impacts of oil spills to uh, the wetlands, both in terms of the plants and the fish and the people. <laughs> so I hope that you all um, choose to tune in for that. And we're also having a series of events, of web-based events again, uh, around the Gulf um, starting next week as well, um, commemorating 10 years of Gomery science in the Gulf of Mexico. So uh, I hope you all choose to check those out against gulfseagrant.org. And with that, I'd just like to thank um, my funding sources and Sea Grant and LUMCON for hosting this awesome uh, website web <laughs> webinar and um there's a lot of cool cool recordings on the site if you haven't already checked them out so i just wanted to say thank you again to mert and to craig for coordinating these and with that i'm going to stop sharing my screen <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you, Emily. That was fantastic. And definitely some topics that we don't hear much about anymore. Um, so it's really good to have those reminders since we are coming up on, you know, several years since the oil spill. So um, while our audience is typing in their questions, um, we did have a few that came in during your talk. So I'll start with those. Sure. Um, the first one is from Jamie. And Jamie is asking, after dispersions or weathering of the oil, do we know if there are any residuals left that we should be concerned about in the water column um, in marine life or in birds? Okay, that's a good question. So in the water column, I would say probably not. Um, I guess that there is the, my understanding is that the possibility after a, a, a really big storm event, then if there is uh, an area where there's some buried oil in the sediments, then that can be uh, maybe resuspended for a short period of time afterward. So there may be a, a small increase, but then it goes back down again. Um, and then the other part of that question was asking if there's oil in what other animals or what other items? Um, marine life, including birds. That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I will say that, uh, as I mentioned, because higher order animals have this ability to uh, detoxify their bodies, um, they're not believed to uh, bioaccumulate oil to, to keep it in their tissues. Um, so I would not expect from what I've seen in the literature, I wouldn't expect to, that they would have those in their, their bodies after this time. Yeah. And I know, um, in CWC, part of our research team was looking at, um, indicator species like the golf killifish and they have a very short lifespan. So, um, yeah, some, some species are short-lived. And so even getting information about how the population responded this far out from the oil spill can be a little bit difficult. Um, but we are doing some studies at the Marine Center, um, part of which was funded by, the, by Gomery through CWC. Uh, with Dr. Brian Roberts in his mesocosm facilities, and he's actually giving mm -hmm. our next talk. Um, so if you're interested in how some of these organisms that Emily talked about tonight have actually responded to oiling experiments, um, Dr. Roberts will talk about some of those next talk. And then uh, if you're interested in the toxicology of oil, if you go to our Science Talk webpage um, on our website, um, Dr. Chris Green gave a talk a few months, of, months ago about his research about um, some small fish after they've been exposed to oil. So check, those, check out those two options. Um, the next question is from Arturo. And um, Arturo is asking if you can address the differences in various ecosystem responses to oil spills, specifically one such as Exxon Valdez spill versus the Deepwater Horizon spill versus the current spill in Marjoris. Oh, am I okay. doing that right? Yeah, I am. Um, I don't know that I'm familiar enough with. The, that spill in Mauritius to be able to comment on it. And uh, I don't know that I'd, I'd feel comfortable comparing the Exxon Valdez spill and the Deepwater Horizon spill. I don't feel like I'm an expert enough in in that that area, that, that particular spill to be able to, to talk about that. But I will give you this promise because I'm an outreach professional. <laughs> if you <laughs> share your email address with Mert um, and then she can share it with me along with your question, I would be happy to try to connect um, 
be with the right person to answer that question for you. And that goes for anyone else too, because I will say that while I spend a lot of time uh, in the world of oil spills, I also spend a lot of time having the luxury of being able to pull up all this different information uh, from different scientific journals at the same time to be able to think about the question a little bit longer. Um, but I'm always happy to connect folks with with people that that actually are actively studying these things that you're asking about. Perfect. And Arturo, that is not an unusual question um, for those of us who were involved in oil spill education. Um, people often asked, uh, asked us about the comparison between Deepwater Horizon and the XL Valdez, um, but very two extremely different events. Um, mm -hmm. Just some of the differences were um, XM Valdez was a very light crude. I'm sorry, it was a very heavy crude. We were a very light crude. Is that right? Am I getting that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, we were very light and they were very heavy. Yeah. Yeah. And um, theirs happened on the coast. It was a surface spill and not a deep water. Um, so our oil was actually coming up from the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. Theirs was a tanker. Um, so two and you know different ecosystems they have a rocky intertidal we don't we have salt marsh and so um two very different situations and two very different responses to those um to those events so again great question um and we're often asked to compare those but it's very hard to make those comparisons um because they were very different events um, the next question is coming from, oh, sorry, Arturo, we'll get to this. Would you say the Gulf of Mexico is more resilient to oil spills due to dealing with constant oil seeps? Ah, okay. So that I can tell you that, um, I think a lot of scientists have speculated on that in the literature and yes, that claim has been made. I don't, I personally don't know if that's correct or not, but I know that that is a speculation that scientists have put out there that because, yes, there are so many oil seeps in the Gulf of Mexico that life has adapted to having some baseline level of oil exposure throughout its life. Perfect. Um, Arturo, if you're interested, I'm sorry, Emily, I keep um, no, it's, it's a discussion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Arturo, if you're especially interested in deep water stuff, there is a brand new paper um, by Cliff Nunley, who did a talk several weeks ago that works in Dr. McLean's lab. Um, but they just had a, an article come out in marine ecology that talks about some of the effects of um, invertebrate communities in the deep ocean at the wellhead site. So um, check that out. It's been listed on our social media, just Facebook or Twitter, just scroll back um, in our feeds and get the names, get the title in, <laughs> of that paper. And it is open access, so it's free. It's free to get to. Um, another, sorry, another question <laughs> is, um, you said in the beginning that GOM, one of Gomery's focuses was to learn more about how to respond to spills. How would you say um, our ability to respond to oil spills has changed? Are we better at it or are we about the same? Ooh, ah, hmm. Okay, so I will, I will clarify that, okay, so Gomery has five focus areas. They are um, the fate and transport of oil, so where it goes in the environment, or oil and dispersants, how it breaks down in the environment, uh, the impacts on the environment and uh, animals and people, and then technology used to study spills, not 
to necessarily to respond to spills. Um, in terms of whether or not we're better at responding to spills, uh, I don't know. I can't answer that. <laughs> I'm not a I'm not an emergency responder, but I will say that I think that um, that I have been really impressed with how much dedication and conversation is uh, spent on talking about oil spill response. And I know Mert knows that also because the CWC has been involved in the different area committees as well. And um, there's there's constantly a lot of uh, discussion and planning and, um, and a betterment of contingency plans to try to make sure that that every spill response is the very best that it can be. So, uh, yeah, that's that's my answer to that. <laughs> yeah, and I do have to say, um, at least from our standpoint, is we don't know. We haven't had a, fortunately, we haven't had a spill like the Deepwater Horizon since Deepwater Horizon. Um, but you know, money funding for research was um, was available, and so the amount we know about the Gulf of Mexico, its coast, and a billion other things is greater than it was in 2010, right? And so you kind of have to figure because of that knowledge increase, we can now respond with better knowledge. Um, so our toolkit is a little bigger, maybe, um, for responding to spills and being able to respond to all the stuff that goes with that, like um, the social economic end, um, the human impacts to the communities, both financially as well as uh, well-being and mental health. I know there were some consortiums yeah. that were even dealing with the social um, aspect of of those kind of disasters. So I think that you know every event is going to be different, but I think our toolkit is just bigger now, and which means that we'll be able to respond better. Yeah, I agree with that absolutely, and especially to um, something that I was reflecting on before giving this talk this evening is as you said, Mert, how much more we know about the environment now, because before Deepwater Horizon, um, baseline baseline data wasn't wasn't there. You know, like it's hard to say what you know what exactly uh, happened. And well, okay, I'm trying to think of how to say it. It's hard to say what the preconditions were in terms of. Um, the the environment because there there wasn't a lot of funding to study that stuff but um because of of different you know research initiatives and funding agencies now we know so much more about the environment and that that baseline level of data and also more about um like deep sea habitats for example that we didn't know about uh as much before in, in the past in the gulf of mexico yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we would, uh, Emily and I would attend the oil spill ecosystems conference. Is it a con? Yeah, it was a conference. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was that meeting I was required to go to? Um, but the amount of science that would be presented in a four day period of time was just, it was inspiring and mind boggling to, to see how many people were active in not only finding those baseline points, right? And how much more we were learning about the Gulf of Mexico than we ever had before. Yeah. Yeah. It was really, it's really cool. I'm going to uh, let you go, Emily. It's been, it's been an hour. So um, I do want to really thank you for presenting tonight. It was a great talk. Um, and like I said, always better to to reflect on on these things 
because life does move forward. We have other things that we're dealing with right now. But it's always great to reflect on our ocean and coastal habitats and the stresses that oil spills do put on that. Yeah. Um, so thank you. And I really have enjoyed the last 10 years being uh, a, not necessarily a coworker, but an inspired admirer of your work, Emily. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that. Um, remember folks, if you attend 10 LUMCON talks, you get a free research vessel. Sorry, I'm forgetting words again. Research vessel, Pel research vessel Pelican Challenge coin. <laughs> That's it. So if tonight was your 10th talk, you'll be getting an email from me either tomorrow or Monday asking for an address. Remember, if you don't send me an address, then I can't send you your challenge coin. So um, if you do get an email from me, please let me know where to send your challenge coins because they really are cool and we really do want to thank you for attending so many of our talks and being a dedicated member of the LumCon community. Um, cool. If you have any questions that we didn't answer tonight, um, please feel free to email me. You all should have my email now. Um, email you, me any questions and I will make sure that Emily gets those. Awesome, thank you so much, Mert. And also to everyone uh, who, who hung in there for the hour. And <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm, at some points I realized that I probably made super nationally long pauses. I hope you all couldn't hear the screaming toddler in the background. <laughs> <laughs> That was me no, wondering, <laughs> wondering, oh no, can they hear? Oh no, will he, will he break into the room I'm in? <laughs> that's just, that's just the nature of working from home. We're all used to it now. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much. And thank you, Mert. And it's been awesome being a, a colleague and a friend of yours as well. Thank you, Emily. Good night, everyone. Be safe and take care of each other. <laughs> Thanks.